Hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion between the Honoris Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are, are discussing a play, actually. This is called Dog Eaters, a play, and it's by Jessica Hagedorn. And it actually was a novel before it was a play. Um, but this is the one where, oh, and there's the novel that Sheila has. So before we get started with our discussion, we'll just briefly go around and do um, intros. I'll start. I'm Lucy. I work at the library um, as a library tech. I do youth programming, but I also do programming for adults, including a lot of these discussions. I am a white woman in my early 50s. I have brown hair that's pulled back right now. Uh, glasses. I'm wearing a jean jacket and I'm sitting in an office that has a lot of um, postcards and posters hung up behind me. And my name is Jacob. I am also an uh, Ann Arbor District Library employee in the outreach department. I am a 30-year-old white male with blonde hair. I'm wearing a blue-gray t-shirt and I'm sitting between two bookcases. My name's Emily. I am a librarian at ADL. I get books for uh, adult nonfiction now and do mostly programming for adults. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have a reddish hair in a braid that just goes past my shoulders, and I'm wearing a green t-shirt. I'm sitting in front of a mostly blank whitish wall uh, with a print of Matisse's goldfish behind me with lots of lights reflected on it. So you maybe couldn't tell what it is anyways. And hey everyone, I'm Sheila. I'm the uh, the founder of the Honorace Book Club and co-facilitator. I'm based in Ferndale, not in Ann Arbor, but um, always love having these conversations with the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, I am an Indian American woman in my early thirties wearing glasses, uh, long black hair that goes well past my shoulders. Um, parted in half, and I'm wearing a pink shirt with my blurred out background, and I'm wearing glasses as well. And before we get started, I want to just actually touch on a point that Lucy brought up where uh, maybe people are reading the play. I actually could not access the play, so I'm reading the novel, and I'm really looking forward to having a conversation about how the plots may differ, or may stay the same between these two forms. And the book Dog Eaters is a it's an, the novel was written in 1990 or published in 1990 and is a satire or take on uh, the recent history, political history in the Philippines, written by a Filipino author who mi migrated to the U.S. Um, as a teenager or young adult. So really thinking about what does it mean to be Asian American and all of its complexities, especially through writing. Um, I'm really excited to talk about what this means, what that her story means for this book. So I'm going to open it up and ask, what did people think about the play slash novel? I thought it was so interesting to read a play, first of all. Um, it took me back to like my high school theater days. And there's something about, first of all, it's totally helpful to have that list of characters at the beginning that you can flip back to and remind. I wish I had that for most of the books that I read, especially ones like this, where uh, I actually had intentions of reading it in one sitting thinking like, oh, like when you go to a play, but life did not uh, allow that. And so it was really nice. I read the first act all in one and the second act I had to read in several pieces. And so it was so good to look back on. Um, but what I really appreciated about it was in, you know, it's not very thick and there's a ton of characters in it, but I felt like we got to know them in such a distilled format, like you have to with a play, uh, that I I thought that they did a really good job of that. Uh, and so I had, I found myself caring about characters who perhaps I'd only read six sentences they'd said. Um, which I really enjoyed having that through the lens of learning more about the Philippines because uh, a lot of the recent history that this covers, I was alive for, but not of an age where I was taking in any kind of world news, let alone national news. And uh, so I spent a lot of time reading here and then going to Wikipedia uh, or at the very end, I wish I would have read the end at the beginning. If someone has the play, it ends with a uh, timeline of 
key events in Philippines history, but told through, you get kind of the voice of the author in it too. So you get a little bit of opinion in there. And I thought that was so helpful. Uh, I read that through a couple times. So I'm really glad that this was put in my hands because I, I don't typically pick up plays, so I never would have read it otherwise. Uh, but I found myself thinking about it a lot, even since finishing it. The play is so incredibly expansive. And uh, I was just, I, I would love to see it performed on stage. But reading it, of course, is an experience in itself. Um, and you definitely, uh, the dialogue, also, um, I don't know the right word for it, maybe the playwright's note before the, the play itself begins and the um, like glossary and historical things that you had touched on, Emily, towards the end of the book, that really filled out the reading experience for me. And I found myself wanting to know more and more um, and kind of going down like a nerdy, hyper-focused wormhole um about Filipino history and about Amelda Marcos um so it's just been an opportunity to learn so much and um yeah the, I, I, where do you even start there's so much to discuss so I'm excited yeah I also really enjoyed um reading this in a, a play format one of the things I love about reading plays is that you do get those stage directions which I think really are intentional and add to the story. And I, they, there weren't tons in here, but you were, she was definitely putting you in a, a time and place. Um, one of my favorite plays we ever read was actually with the Unerased Book Club. It was um, the Brothers Paranormal, which is like, if you haven't read that play and you liked reading plays, go read this play. But um, the thing that was so great about this play, I thought were the, um, the two narrators who were the way that they were put in this story they were like the narrators but they were also part of the story and what they were narrating was what was we were seeing but they were also talking about a soap opera so it like really added this layer of drama like as if the soap opera that we were watching was what was unfolding in front of us in this play and then you know, which kind of gave it like this humorous element in a way. And I did actually find two scenes that I could watch on um, YouTube. I don't know if anyone else did that, but that like helped me understand some of the humor, like in the first one. And then the the narrators, I don't know, they kind of reminded me of like Effie and I don't remember the other guy from the Hunger Games who were like kind of just giving you this play-by-play -play in this really overblown way but then it there are these moments in this play that are completely horrible and so it's just a really interesting way to have that story told um in a in a format on stage where you are being kind of you're getting the story twice in, through two different lenses I don't know if that makes any sense but I just I thought the narrators were a really great uh, element of the whole thing so it's wild how thin the play is because this is how sorry I know it's blurred. This is how thick the book is. It's like it's two hundred fifty pages, um, and I'm about halfway through. And if I had known, I could just drive on down to Ann Arbor to borrow the play for like a day, just sit in the library and read it. <laughs> it would have been way faster. But um, I'm now very curious to think like to if anybody's even picked up the book. Uh, to compare and contrast, like how you condense, like this book is already extremely dense in and of itself. Like the way that it's um structured is each chapter is a new perspective. It's a new character's perspective. You get a lot of backstory. You get a lot of introspection and um a lot of gossip in those short stories. And I I, I figured from the two scenes I saw on YouTube that. The gossip component is a really big theme in the play. Um, but it's like it, it is deeply written inside of these like these short perspectives. And how do you combine all of that to make a really tight play? Or like I'm assuming it's like maybe an hour runtime looking at the size of that play, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. I could see it is two acts, 
I could see that this could be up to two hours, and especially how long. Like for example, um, there are scenes in a nightclub where there are drag performances. The director could choose to make that three minutes, one minute, five minutes. Uh, there's music. There's um, commercials. Yeah. There's so I don't know how long it would run for on stage. I think so much would be up to the direction of the play itself. I thought it was really interesting too. She, in the author's note at the beginning, this is actually the second version of the play. Um, and that one of the changes or perhaps even the main change uh, was the addition of those soap opera narrators. And in hearing that the gossip is such a big piece of the book, I imagine that that was probably one of the reasons why they added because they bring in that tone, both with people the you know scandal worthy things that happen in their soap opera that you see little bits of and hear little bits of that tend to also mirror other scenes going on at the same time um i think that was one of the things that were was more challenging about reading it in the play mm -hmm. was the number of scenes where there were multiple settings and multiple stories going on at once um i had to read those those parts really slowly and think and try to think of voices for these characters. But I can just imagine going to see the show and having it be that more immersive experience where you don't have to take that moment to think, wait, who is that again? Because you see them. And so your brain jumps to that. Uh, but I, I just can't imagine the skill and the time it takes to take a novel and figure mm -hmm. out which of your scenes of your novel have both similar themes are happening at round about the same time and that they could be interspersed like that. It just, it boggles my mind and I'm so impressed by it. And I imagine I would be even more impressed if I had read the book. So we, I am, I love that she uses um, the soap opera narr like narrative technique because that's one of the first things you learn about one of the characters, uh, Rio, who I'm assuming is one of the uh, narrators. Um, Rio... Oh, she's not. Okay. Um, it just seemed like from the one clip I saw that she was going to be a narrator, but I'm glad I'm wrong. Um, she, Rio uh, spends a lot of time with her Lola after everyone goes to sleep after hosting big parties. And every night spends time with the, peop the people who work in the home and Lola to watch soap operas. Like that's her escape and to eat food with her hands. And not have to do a whole huge production for dinner. She'll like eat a little bit at dinner with her parents and sibling, but then actually eat what she thinks is like real food, um, like home style food um, while watching the soap opera. And it's not mentioned that frequently throughout the book, but to see that how um how Hagedorn like repurposes it as a as the primary narrative te narrative technique is really fascinating. And then um, on the gossip component, about halfway through the book, um, there's a comment from, I think, one of the generals that, or maybe it's the president, who says, like, I'm amused by all the gossip because that's actually where the truth comes from. And I was listening to an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Hagedorn, and another author, and they were also saying, like, in the the authors from Jamaica, like he's like, oh, when I come uh, in Jamaica, we say, like, um, don't get your news from the news, get it from gossip. And that's like, as I'm getting deeper and deeper in this book, it's becoming more and more true because they they intersperse the small narrative chapters with, um, like either real or doctored uh, news clippings or um, anthropological uh, journals. And it's like a collage of pop culture and history within a fictional narrative. Yeah, the the gossip, I mean, obviously is a big part of both the stories. And I think like you were saying, Emily, they brought the narrators in to, um, they still talk about gossip a lot in this play, but we're also receiving constant gossip. The thing that, about the soap operas is interesting is it's not just um there's like multiple characters who are enjoying the the soap operas including like these you know um like 
can't remember which general, you know, like the, the generals, like the people who it's complete in completely in opposition of what you'd think their personality would be like, like they are, um, you know, they're like chief of military, but then they also just love these soap operas that are giving them, um, the story so it, it it's interesting to think about how it showed up in the novel which i don't know i haven't read it and then how it was maybe taken some of the things were taken and expanded in a broader sense throughout the play that makes me think of the scene where all the generals including like the opposition like the opposition party like they all go golfing together and the vibe kind of is like, hey, I heard you're building an army. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And, and he's like, yeah, I kind of am. And they're like, oh, well, hmm, you should watch out. But also maybe not. Who knows? T -t -t -t. And it's like, uh, I, I, I'm like, am I completely misreading this scene? Or are they they're, are they all friends? Or are they all... Um, uh, but framing it... In, through the, the the lens of this gossip or chismosa or what, what's there's a word they use in Tagalog, which I, I if I could remember it, it's just like the best word ever. But it, I think you just said I think these, you just said it. It was ch chismos, right? A ch yeah. chis I know in Spanish it's chismosa, but um, it's kind of the same. I think it's it says it comes from Spanish of chismos. Yeah, I love it. But even even these big tough military men are like. Mm, tu, 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 tu. Um, which <laughs> was really interesting and like I said I, I, I'm dying to see it performed that makes me think Jacob what you were saying about it, like it, it's hard not to especially just like where we are in the political cycle right now it's very hard not to compare politics but the idea of like the playing nice over a golf game or the like well we get along as long as we aren't talking about these things that I feel like perhaps there used to be a lot more of that like well yes you're from this party and I'm from this party but we're still gentlemen and we golf together um and then those times when you're kind of forced to be together if that you know Day of national remembrance things like that and it's but it's interesting like that that scene was also the scene that i i had to read a few times mostly because i had a hard time keeping the various general roles straight in my head um and i i honestly i i have a harder time keeping track of male characters and i know that's like that's just my own bias i i tend to keep track of female characters more because i tend to relate to to them more uh but it was just like ugh, these old men in power like i know i need i know they're important to this story but i kept finding myself flipping back to that at the beginning and looking and saying okay this one is this one is this guy and going back and looking and flipping back and forth and reading um I, those the scenes of the people in power were much less interesting to me than the scenes with the more common folk. It's interesting to hear you say, Emily, about like it's hard not to read about political situations and compare them to today. Uh, there were parts of this that I thought were really interesting because I I can remember like Amelda Marcos and all her shoes and her extravagance and um, so much of that part was played up like I mean I wasn't really tracking it but like that's just a thing that you know I knew about her and there's this interview with Melda Marcos in the play where she's like oh these shoes no I've had them for like five years and they were made by someone local and this is the really and she's just obviously lying about everything that she's wearing but it but she's just the way she's like presenting it as fact and truth and it just reminded that piece did remind me a lot of today because like the media hears something they tell a story but they're really just you know it's the questions they ask and it's how the person who they're interviewing decides to to sell it um and even if you know something is lies it's like you can still say it and and so it just it was also amusing because it was so the opposite of 
of what was true. Um, but there were moments where I was like, huh, you know, that sounds a little familiar. Which is, I mean, to today. To, um, very tangentially, but you're, you brought up something you brought up. I really want to talk through um, that media will just they'll have their own agenda, anchors, whomever. And if something's lie, they don't immediately push back on it. I came across a moderated debate for the Colorado Fourth Congressional District, uh, uh, the governor, sorry, the Republican candidates for that seat. And the news anchor for one of the local stations was the moderator. And he immediately, he just like pushed back immediately. He's like, that is a lie. You did not answer the question. You did not answer the question. You did not answer the question. And then it sent me on the spiral of like watching 25, 30 minute interviews that he did with those same candidates on his TV program. I was like, I do not live here. I do not really care about what you all are talking about. But to know that there's at least one media personality out there that um still is able to um get repeat uh pro not performances but repeat interviews and build trust with these um public figures who he is then on the flip side like calling out and telling like this is not true or you did not answer my questions or um you still haven't like apologized for what you have done or like calling out their very horrific behavior um and when I'm reading, when I was reading the book, there's so many scenes where different news outlets will cover an event or cover um, just talking about press conferences. And there's no attempt at critical analysis of what's actually happening or pushing further. And that felt very viscerally real, <laughs> like still happening. Yes, uh, that brings to mind the scene from the play with the Manila Film Center and how um, I think it was, a, what, 170 some people were killed almost instantly in a concrete accident in the building of this. Um, Imelda Marcus wanted to have a film festival, so she built this film center. All these people die uh, in a horrible concrete accident. And they just keep building on top of the uh, of their dead bodies. And I'm like, that is a really grim metaphor for for ignoring the truth, um, examining the truth, and uh, we're able to see the priorities of a government in this really kind of loud, absurd, and tragic way. Well, and absurd is the word for it. I read about that, and I said wait, that can't be real, right? But then I looked it up and it was. And I think about things like that. And I recognize that like there are a lot of atrocities in the world. And so to be caught up on the atrocities that you missed when you were a child or before you were born, like that doesn't always happen. But I can't, I can't believe I'm finding out at age 35 about this thing that happened when I was still alive, when my parents were still cognizant that... I'm finding out because it's something that happens in a book. And I think, oh, this is, there's too many details in this that sound like they could be real and look it up. And I'm really curious about how that story was reported here in the U.S. at that time. I'm, I'm going to my parents for dinner tomorrow and I it may be a weird dinner conversation, but I think I'm going to ask what they remember and what they heard because before reading this, the only thing that I really knew about Imelda Marcos was shoes. And that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's very much like that. That just is the first thing. Like if you if you're doing word association, Imelda Marcos, you'd say shoes. But, you know, like, yeah, you do look further into Imelda Marcos and you learn that um, she and her husband hold the Guinness World Record for the greatest robbery of a government. So it's like their extravagance was was so over the top and um that building that is built literally on the bodies of people now i think is abandoned and rumored to be haunted um so it's just like yet another place where this sort of like um these ruins of of extreme extravagance at the cost of 
of people um, is an example. And then you, do, you, but that news is like you're saying, Emily, that's not something that, yeah, I learned it from reading this play. And um, we just made jokes about shoes in this, you know, country. Having a lot of thoughts about this right now, like how easy it is to book, like reduce um, uh, any head of state into a stereotype. I think he's specifically about female head of states or or partners of states. Like what happened in Bangladesh recently, where um, at a high level, people are like, "Oh, well, Bangladesh has had a female prime minister." It's like, but she was pretty horrible too, and like part of a political dynasty that. Um, it was either her or another woman that were both dynastic um, picks and there was no actual change happening. And maybe that's why there was a student led revolution that toppled their government. And that um, like, we can dig a little deeper than just either, oh, it's great that a lady is in charge or, oh, that lady likes shoes or like, there's so much more to power and elite status um, than a little byline. Uh, and it's interesting, like, again, the novel has a lot more detail, but the women are written to um, have that surface level interest in shoes or in clothing or beauty. And the younger generation is either following it or aggressively pushing back because they're seeing like how easy it is to fall into the trap of running a household without actually doing the physical labor of running a household and where does that leave you what other interests do you get to have um how else do you get to contribute to your own life um and keep away the malaise that comes with it uh, so there's like a lot of commentary on gender in the book and in the play like a, a way more than i was expecting especially for a book published in 1990 that already had so many other factors going against it, that it's a Filipino writer, that it's a book about a very, like in that time, very recent world events um, that were not probably covered nearly as widely if we're thinking about what was in the, what was in the news at that time, which would have been the Gulf. Um, so I'm like incredibly impressed with the nuance of gender and the depth of which Hagador like takes the reader into what it means to explore gender in the Philippines at this time. Really thinking about Joey, thinking about like the the drag uh, drag queens, the um, ways that gender and sexuality interplay, and the the there's a word for um, third gender that they use in the book. I don't know if they use it in the play. Um, like definitely normalizing that it's like a part of their culture. The more I hear you talk about the book, I I need to add it to my list. I am so glad you made that point that it was that its publication date was so close to when all this was happening. I just, even though I knew that it came out in the 90s and that they I hadn't tied those two together. I yeah, how did how did she get it published? This is kind of amazing. Yeah, I I'm think that was thinking, Emily, also, I'm like, okay, that book's going on my list. I mean, my long reading list, that book is going to go there. Because it's just like, especially if you've read the play, it's just going to take something you've got some of and show you a different side of it or um, expand on it and... It, it's just interesting to think about reading them both, you know, to have that comparison. And like beyond sexuality and gender, not beyond, that's not the right word, but also uh, the play is um, sexual um, in a way that feels very transgressive. Um, you see sex acts performed on stage. Um, uh, that in itself, uh, um, I don't know what uh, its important is, its importance is, but I'm like, there, there's something there that I need to kind of dig more about or um, understand more about uh, the role of sex itself in the history of, of the Philippines 
and um, how their culture functions. I don't like how their culture functions, but you know what I'm saying. We know what you meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like you. That's you. But you, okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I will well, stop talking I now. No, no, you're good. I don't know if this was in the play, but there's an entire vignette of an actress, um, an actress and one of her admirers, who's the general, um, having a sexual encounter. And I was reading that there was an actress, an American actress, who shot in the, who did a film in the Philippines, and met the president and had an affair with him. And that she recorded and then played it at a press conference and then like oh. had it on the University of Philippine or like University of Manila's radio system. So they like played it on a loop. Imelda kept a tape recorder under their bed. That's who it was. Okay. I didn't know if it was Imelda the taped the... it. There is a it's... scene that's taped the in this in the play, right? There's the um the actress and yeah, the she she is filmed, but she didn't film it. Yeah, it was filmed by the other, by the um, military lead, the per the guy she was yeah. having the sexual encounter with. So, so yeah, I I I, I have to um, recommend watching the Kingmaker. It is a documentary on um, Paramount Plus. It was made in 2019, and it follows Imelda Marcos in 2019. Um, her son. What was, what was that called? The Kingmaker. Kingmaker. Okay. Uh, my jaw was on the floor from the first thirty seconds. The first scene is her pulling up to a red light, opening a window, and passing out dollar bills to children. I was like, "This is craziness," but it, I realized that we weren't watching Amelda. We were watching Amelda do the character Amelda. And we see that same sort of of, of distance between reality and and, and um, fantasy in the play as it is framed through these like um, soap opera, but I see them even more as kind of like morning show hosts. Um, there's a performativeness. There is a, these people are acting. And Amelda was, I think Amelda is a, grand actress um you got I, I watched 30 minutes of it and my mouth was the whole time uh super interesting and uh illuminated certain parts of the play for me and made stuff make sense I feel like there's a word they maybe mentioned it in the play and I was trying to look up a computer that that is like basically the um the um a meldification of like it's like the they made the act of acting like her into a, a word but um maybe i didn't read it in the play maybe i read it somewhere else like wish i could find it because she was it was very much a performance that she was you know yes intentionally putting on and that yeah oh it is okay in meldific Oh, ML Defect. And guess it who was coined it? It was coined. <laughs> Amelda Marcos. Amelda. Amelda created ML Defect. Mm -hmm. Which, ooh, ooh. I know. I think, too, in taking in something in the play format, it makes you already think a little bit more about the the performances that characters do themselves because uh good actors will will show you the difference between when someone is naturally being themselves and when they're putting something on um and there is a lot of putting things on whether it is the actual shows within the show whether it is the drag show or the show with the sex acts but then there's people who are representing themselves differently depending on who their audience is I mean, all of this, I know we've said this many times. I would love to see this show. I want I want to see it done so well because I just in reading the play, you can see you can see the potential when it's in the hands of the right people that if I, you know, if I'm moved by reading the descriptions of things, which can sometimes get a bit clunky, there weren't too many stage directions in this that can sometimes change momentum, but I just can only imagine 
seeing it. Uh, so if any of you hear that it's coming, coming nearby, U of M's going to do it or something. We, we got to spread the word. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thinking about the, the, sh the shows and the layers of, um, cause I think it opens with like a beauty pageant, right? Or they're talking about Daisy having won this beauty pageant, but the final scene of the play, which is scene 16 is called final pageant. And the last line of the play is my soap opera continues. The soap opera of the Philippines continues. Curtain. But I think that that's um, just, you know, like to bookend it with these, with starting the show and, and finishing with that. Um, yeah, it would be great to see because I feel like it would, could really be um, made even to be full of more pageantry, I think, than it reads. It's just so wild to me that the Philippines was a colony of the United States, and yet we know nothing about it. Um, I mean, not like we, people know much about the colonies we currently hold, um, but it's, yeah, like that's an entire country with a huge diaspora here and very little representation anywhere. Like in Metro Detroit, there's, I guess, Jolly Bee is, we can count that, but there's two Filipino restaurants in Metro Detroit, um, when there's a massive community here. I'm just like, it just feels like with, with every quote unquote small community, we have to like grasp at straws to understand like the enormity of the history that they carry. Um, like that's just how I felt, right? Like I'm only halfway through this book. I am obsessed. I like cannot wait to go back to reading it. Um, I was sitting in a ch comfy chair with a comfy blanket, eating some pretzels, just like devouring it. And like, I shouldn't, I, I kept reading, I kept getting distracted, trying to look up all these different illusions. Like, who is this actress that they mentioned? Like, what's this event that happened? The um, the mall collapsing or the c cinema hall collapsing? That is only barely, like, put, starting to be introduced at the, the, at the point that I'm at. It is an aside but it is such a pivotal moment in all of these characters' lives. Like you're starting to see it in different narr in different vignettes. Um, like Hagenor is just like a masterful writer. And I can't believe that she was in her 20s when this was published. I like barely had a grasp on my life, let alone like the, a grasp of the English language and mastering this really highly technical writing. Yeah, I feel like I was constantly looking stuff up while I was reading it. It took me a little bit to realize that there was a glossary at the back of the play. So for the beginning, I was like, wait, do I write down the words and go back and look them up? Do I look them up as they start? And then I saw the glossary and I was like, okay, that helps me greatly. But even still, yeah, everything you read, you're like, you want to know, did that really happen? Is that just part of the story? Is that, um, yeah, it's, it's just... Um, and I feel like even trying to have a an hour long discussion about it, that there are like there are themes that are going throughout, like besides just gossip and you know, it there are I mean, there's just so much there. I feel like even trying to find information about it online, you come across like these huge, you know, um like twenty page long papers that people wrote, or it's on a syllabus and you know, it's just like it, there's just it's so could be so richly mined for for what he created i feel so frequently with uh the book selected for this that i do i wish that i could read it now like i am with my the knowledge i have at 35 but to have the time and the guidance of the english professors that i had in undergrad uh because you kind of need both of those things to fully be able to appreciate something um, because you're right. There's, we could be talking about just one scene and I think we're maybe all kind of struggling at like, well, how, how far do we dive in? How much do we talk about this one character who we, who is only a small slice of this and we only get a little bit of um, it there's there is there's so much here and I want an expert to hold my hand and walk me through it 
it's like I want to start a book club, but that's also like a class. Like, yeah. can we just make it more, please? Like, <laughs> the thing that the real, you know, like book nerds really want is just to do a deep dive and maybe spend multiple times talking about this book, Emily. but with every book. Yeah. I was going to say, Emily, could you send any of the 20 page papers or uh, sorry, Lucy, any of the like the yeah. long papers yeah. that you've read? Because yeah, totally. I, I want, somebody already did the work. Let me honor that work. No, I know. I will. <laughs> yeah. Next, I was like, I don't have time to read these right now, but um, I want to. So yes, I will. I will share them. Uh, I was wondering who your favorite character was and why. If you had one or like most like, or the character that made you feel the most or the character that um, entertained you the most, even if they weren't your favorite per se. Definitely rooting for Joey. But it's complicated and it's gritty and it's dark, but we're cheering for Joey. But of course, as one can imagine, I would I would very like much like to hang out with Chikating and Perlita. Especially, I think what's so interesting is that Perlita is the brother of one of the generals. And I'm like, Perlita, I know you know all the chismosa and everything else that I want in this world. Um, I just know that it would be a hoot. Um, that those are my I favorite characters. More. Yes. And I love Rio, too. Yeah, all of those scenes uh, at Perlita's club where they were not, I mean, the whole play has so much humanity in it, but I feel like they had, it had everything that I wanted in those scenes. We we had the humor, we had the getting to know some of our characters deeper. It's where some of the, the drama happens right there. Um, and I think you mentioned it earlier, Jacob, but I think those could be, I would love to see a stage show envision it because there, there's so much potential there for how how this home, because it, it very much is that third place. And you can see that it is that for characters who we see in the book. And also you can see how it would be for characters we don't even see. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I would have loved more, th more of that. Really, I would have loved more of all of them. And I think it's a better play that there isn't, but that's another reason why I want to pick up this book because I want to know the backstory and and fill in some of these these well sketched but sketched characters that we got that I imagine are more filled in in the novel. Yeah, like if it was a TV show, there'd be so many opportunities for spinoffs. It's just, you know. Um a character that really interested me and not because she was Daisy, only because I think she was, well, I mean, her her story is kind of sad and she gets, um, but that, that was interesting because it's like, I feel like a lot of this book was talking about serious stuff, but there was all this humor, but then there's moments with Daisy where you just realize um, how much of a pawn she is and just like, um, you know, again, going back to the role of gender, like this is how she's getting used as um, a young woman in, in multiple ways, like being a beauty queen. And then, um, you know, in the the scene to the end, um, and it really isn't until the end where she finally comes into her own, I think, as far as like, um, you know, finding a role for herself. But she, she was interesting to me just because I think she was really telling a story i mean just what happened to her was was part of this was the story that was being told um so while not my favorite so far or like i don't really have a lot of feelings towards it but senator domingo avila and so daisy's father um the every scene with him i just think of um senator santos from the west wing i can't remember the actor's name for the life of me but um he I that's the type of like gravitas I'm picturing for somebody to be in the opposition and to quote still be alive you have to have charisma and you have to have some sort of following that continues to push you higher and higher into politics um but the character that is starting to interest me is Rio's mother um just because you could like she's kind of this center of what it means to be like 
so taken care of you have nothing else going on and you like in the scenes with her friends she lets loose a little bit and you're starting to like where she gets um uh, again this is there's a lot of backstory in the book um her walls are starting to come down and she from time to time forgets that rio's in the room when certain pieces of her other private lives come out um and I just, I'm very curious, again, because I'm only halfway through, I'm curious to see where that goes, but it's also very much a reflection of how children see their mothers and what they think they know versus what they know versus how, um, for like just the, the, the rosy lens that so many children have of their mothers, which is, they should have, but where that starts to crack is interesting. I don't, it's interesting because I don't even think she's a character in the play at all. I know. It's, so it's like, now I'm just like, okay, I have to read the book. But um, that's just so interesting that she seems like integral to telling this part of the story. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like what I was trying to say with Daisy. It's kind of like the opposite with Daisy, but just because like, because of the fact that you are somebody's child, like your life might unfold in a certain way that's so much beyond your control. Um, it's either how like information is being spun for you or just the like the actions that are happening around you that your parents are involved in. But it's fascinating to me that she's not in the play. I had to just double check and I'm like, wait, did we hear about her? But no. I think oh, her father mentions her in passing once and in a kind of like a your mother is, I, I don't know if they were split up. There was definitely some derision in the one time that she was mentioned offhand. Oh, this is very interesting. And I need to read the play to see where <laughs> those gaps are. So um, a lot of this, a lot of like the supporting or smaller, like fictional, like very fictional as opposed to fictionalized characters are based on the author's family. Um, And she, I don't think she said that explicitly, but it's pretty clear in interviews. Um, so, for instance, um, her parents split up when she was a teenager, and that's how she ended up in San Francisco, much like Rio ends up in the United States. Um, and when asked how her family in the Philippines reacted to this book, she said that all of her cousins were mad, quote, why did you have to put our family business out there like that? Which would be something that Pucho would say, too. I mean, obviously, it's like, is she like already knew her family would be pissed. <laughs> um, but then the scenes with the rebels um, in doing research for this book, her family took her and like introduced her to people who were part of that political scene. And she got a lot of firsthand knowledge and all of them were cool with her using their information, just not their names. Which like how much trust do you build up and how, like how quickly and how do you maintain that? So if you want to use those like similar stories or extract different narratives out from those people, like you can do it over time. That's what a gift. I feel like there has to be part two of this discussion where we come back and we've read like, you know, like Sheila, you've read the play and we've read the book and then we can pair notes because it it's just like so much the same story but then so much i mean like putting the two of them together would just be like would be a, a really great discussion slash class and then we need a mini course on filipino history and we need a sit down lunch with the playwright and then we'll have all our bases covered <laughs> I know I know I was really late in sending out the email for this book and I really hope there's a bunch of people who at least start it um because we have the other book club tomorrow night um but it's like I am so blown away by this by this novel like I haven't been um as deeply enthralled or impressed by writing in a few months um so if you're watching this and you're 50 minutes into this conversation like 
if it hasn't been abundantly clear, please pick up the play from the Ann Arbor Library or pick up the book. Um, it is like chef's kiss. And so this actually, uh, this play was recommended to me by um, regular reader, Matt Ingram, uh, his partner, Ben, his uh, aunt works in play, like the playwriting or play production space in the Northeast. And she recommended this play. So I need to text him and give a big thank you because this is like completely blown away any expectations I had. Yeah, well, and thank him from us too, because we also got the benefit once again of you picking something great that, I don't know, I mean, I wouldn't have picked up this play. Um, so, you know, not only did I get so much out of it, but now I'm also gonna read the novel and, you know, um, and continue to do deep dives into like most of the things I read about. She really just feels like a writer's writer. You know, like for authors that want inspiration or want to study craft, like she's one of those. Um, and it feels like such an honor to have access to that, that expertise. And she's written like five more books, I think. So um, I'm looking forward to over time because her books are dense to like explore those. Um, if you'd like to uh, dive deeper into the nerdy wormhole, uh, recently, I think as recent as last season on Broadway, was a musical called Love Lies Bleeding, which is a retelling of this same historical time period. Um, and this makes perfect sense. It is set completely in a disco. So kind of in the way that this is a soap opera, it's set in a disco and it um, is the story of Imelda Marcos in Filipino history um, with music written by David Byrne from the Talking Heads, which I'm like, huh? I know. Ah, no. Okay. Um, but it is an immersive theater piece where the audience is standing in the club as if they were at a club and the performers come out um in the same way they would like in, in perlita's club but it's it, it's not about the club it's a historical piece it's historical disco musical <laughs> give it a youtube watch some of the performances uh i think it's also notable for being one of the first um, Broadway, not off-Broadway productions to have a completely Filipino cast. Um, but I was watching numbers from that uh, on YouTube and I was like, uh, this is really interesting and really cool and this is um, uh, further recommended viewing or reading for those who like this particular uh, novel or play. Jacob, it sounds like you might be a little bit of an uh, Melda head. I don't want to be, because she's she's not, she killed a whole bunch of people. <laughs> she's a horrible person. Let me just say that. But it's fascinating. There's a reason why we talk about Imelda so much. It's because it's fascinating. Um, and it's at the intersection of femininity, power, um, um, militarism, international like you know there's pictures of her like hanging out with Gaddafi and Ronald Reagan and like yeah like it's craziness I yeah I'm just sure I, I'll take it even though I do know she's an evil lady <laughs> I think it's a little bit of the Imelda effect that kind of casts <laughs> its spell on you yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna lie uh, I know what I'm going to be watching tonight as I'm finishing work. <laughs> Paramount Plus, here we go. 
the kingmaker. I'm telling you, it's paused on my TV right now, 30 minutes. I'm like, I'm going to sit down and press play. <laughs> I was wondering when you said you'd only watched 30 minutes. It makes so much more sense now that then this club started and you needed to pause. I was like, what, what made you so interested and not want to finish? Makes so much sense. <laughs> oh, it's, we're the problem, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> Like, to your point, Lucy, like, yeah, a lot of these, a point many minutes ago, a lot of these books dig up so much and dig up so much history or interest and in, like very specific components. And that's why we do the uh, contextualizing links, but we really need like a post, like post book club, uh, like I'm trying to think of a non morbid way of saying this, but just flat, uh, revision and like looking through, thinking about what we cared about and kind of dragging up those pieces. I wish I had bandwidth to do that. <laughs> I know, I mean, every time we finish one of these discussions, I'm thinking like, well, okay, now I feel like I have to read the whole thing over again with the insight and the knowledge that I got from talking about it. And I mean, there's just something really exciting about about sharing what you've read with other people. And that these books just, our plays are so rich with with content for doing that, so. Thank you for picking such good ones. Of course. And thank you all for wanting to read with us. Um, I do want to flag next month's book is a paranormal fiction. Uh, it's called Seven Deadly Shadows by Courtney Alameda and Valian E. Mitani. Um, and this was to replace another book that we thought we would read that turned out to be very bad. Uh, I read one page of the other option and I was like, oh God, what did I do? So I don't think Fatima's read it. Um, I definitely have not, but I really look forward to talking about spooky scaries next month with you guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day if you're watching this in the daylight time. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone.